Um, so let's tie it together and hopefully um, I just want to revisit some definitions. I want to talk about the road ahead and I want to talk about some challenges to implementation. So I showed this definition at the very beginning and we talked hopefully about maximizing resource efficiency. We talked about risk and risk minimization and pollution prevention and pollution minimization and efficient and more effectively benign chemical products and processes. So hopefully that was in your def that is now part of your understanding of what makes sustainable chemistry. You'll notice that there isn't a lot there that's all about hazard and waste but there is in these definitions, okay? So it isn't an either or, it's a both and. And what I hope that you're gonna take away is an expanded scope of what green slash sustainable means. Not get caught up in definitional arguments, but just understand that it's a fairly broad scope. So another thing that I hope you're walking away from is the importance of design. Most of sustainable green chemistry is about how you think, how you think about the problem that you're facing. It's almost, I would say, a philosophy. For those of us who've been in green chemistry for a long time, we, we, we joke about the church of green chemistry. And it's really very similar. I mean, it's a system of beliefs. It's a system of principles. And it's how you think about the world and the viewpoint that you take. And design is critical to that. You have to think these things through from day one. And the reason we have to do that is that in order to make the biggest impacts to products and services and costs, we have to design. We have to really do it from the ground up. We have to do it by design. We have to do it early and we have to do it at multiple times in the process of developing what we're developing. It isn't an inoculation like a vaccine where you do it once and then you can forget about it because as you develop a product, the questions that you ask will change depending on the stage of development, okay? So you've got to constantly revisit your assumptions and presuppositions about what you're trying to do. So here are some short-term uh, things that I hope that you'll begin to work on when you go back to wherever it is that you go to. There is a tremendous amount of need for further education and training because there is this technique gap and I would add thinking gap. Again, the advocacy thing that you were talking about. Most people just don't think about these things. It's not that they're evil or bad people or whatever. It's just that it's not in their way of thinking. And we need to change that. There is a bias to always think that if I do something green or sustainably, it's going to cost more. And get that notion out of your head. If you do it from design principles and from stage one, it will cost you far less in the total life cycle of the product or service that you're doing it will be infinitely less. Um, there is a huge amount of need to embed these things into the business processes. So again, if you're going into industry or if you're going into academia, think about how you can embed these things into your work where you're doing. Um, driving a metrics-driven uh, approach to your research. Metrics are important and choosing the right metrics Okay, we've talked about the metrics, and remember, different metrics have a different story to tell. So it isn't a metric, it's multiple metrics. Um, we need to do a lot of updating, and we really need to think about barriers to new chemistry and technology. In other talks that I've made uh, where I talk about the state of chemistries, I have a graphic which shows the development of chemistries. And if you look at all of the named reactions, a majority of the named reactions, which you know and love, were all developed prior to the 1970s. And nowadays, when you develop a completely new chemistry, it is usually associated with getting a Nobel Prize. That has to change. It isn't okay to just 
keep using the same reactions and demonstrating a Suzuki coupling with a different set of, of materials. We've got to think about how to do things totally different. Okay? Or a Heck reaction or a Wittick reaction or whatever it happens to be. Yes, it's great that you know those reactions, but please go and invent new chemistry, truly new revolutionary chemistry. But there are other things. And you say, well, gee, travel and work and building considerations, does chemistry really have a lot to do with that? Absolutely. Chemistry is in everything and it touches everything. From, again, light weighting, automobiles or airplanes, to coatings which make things go through fluids faster. Air is a fluid, by the way, so if we can come up with a better coating, we reduce the total fuel use. There's huge things that technology enables us. Do we need to travel as much? Can we use video conferencing? Things like that. Building considerations. The built environment accounts for a majority of the energy use in the world. Buildings are inherently energy efficient. There's an enormous amount of chemistry that could be used to make buildings more efficient. So in the medium term, routinely designing more efficient processes, protective of people. Remember this notion of greener or safer or slightly better. It's not an absolute, it's a continuum. And the idea is to move the peg a little bit further forward, all right, as best as we can. Again, simple and elegant. That doesn't mean that this isn't complex. All right, sustainability and green chemistry is inherently complex. So we need to make our approaches as simple as possible to deal with that complexity. Um, easier technology transfer. I could talk for hours about the difficulty of going from bench to bricks and mortar production. All right. And it's a huge barrier to new technology of any kind, anywhere, whether it's green or not, is how do you get people to invest in new technology that you've developed? Huge barrier. And please learn more about life cycle. Because what life cycle tells you is that there are an enormous number of impacts in what you're doing. And just by simple choices in the chemicals that you use will have an amazing difference in the overall environmental impact associated with your chemical or product or process or synthetic route. So we want to design these, in the long term, routinely impact-free processes, or as impact-free as possible, less impact associated with them. Sustainable chemistries, again, we need to come up with new ways of inventing. Again, the synthetic biology approach is another tool. Think about that. Think about alternative ways of making chemicals and exploiting the chemical diversity that's already in existence. Again, if you think about all of the possible isomers after you get up to maybe C10 or C11, it's enormous. We're not even scratching the surface of that chemical diversity at this stage of the game. Don't get tied down with what other people have done and over, uh, over and over and over for many years. Mass productivities, remember, in the, in the batch chemical operating environment, we're straining. So I would say, in GSK, we, we worked for about 10 years to get a 1% goal. And then uh, it, just after I left, it was 2%. All right, 2% mass efficiency as a corporate goal for all our processes at the time. <laughs> we need to routinely be getting to 25 to 50%, which is sort of in the specialty chemicals realm for advanced chemical synthesis. We've got a long ways to go to get there. Um, and reduce life cycle costs. And this is all kinds of costs, not just economic. Environmental costs, social costs, so on and so forth. So this is a long-term proposition. And these are some of the reasons that there are. Okay, In-ground capital, most of the chemical plants that are built have been paid for many times, particularly a multi-purpose chemical plant. And so to change that capital, to go to a paradigm where you're not scaling up from your 
10 liter to a 100 liter to a 1,000 liter reactor to numbering up a 100 one liter fact, uh, type reactors that are continuous is a, an enormous paradigm change for most people. And it's one where it's very difficult to find people willing to do that. The way in which economics and finance are looked at on a business perspective need to change. Again, most business cases are done on capital, how we put in our bricks, mortars, reactors, and all that sort of thing, and the operating expense, and that's it. All of the other costs that are associated around those two things are never considered, and that needs to change. Um, this idea of broader issues and the business climate. We are expecting a financial situation economically not to really change out past 2016. That means that we're in a bear economy, and that means that access to capital is going to continue to be difficult, and you're going to be dealing with this for some time to come. And that makes innovation and technology development and entrepreneurship very difficult in that kind of environment. Our educational system, again, I've challenged you about things like yield purposely and other notions about how you've been trained. And it's almost impossible to get the educational establishment to think differently about how chemistry is taught and teaching it in context. The idea that you can teach the universal gas laws not as though they happen in a beaker, but though they happen in the real world outside. You're not changing what you're teaching, you're changing the context. And that's really what we need to do. We need to make it relevant to people, rather than the beauty and elegance of a concept or a conceptual framework. I mentioned about advocacy and this resistance to change. This is hardwired into us as a species. We don't like change. So you're always going to face that. And the Flip side of that is people wanting to maintain the status quo. So this is just an example of things that why you might run into problems. And it's just the pharma industry, but I could put just about any industry up there. And we've touched on some of these things. And that is, are manufacturing costs significant? And the answer, you know, without the drum roll, is no, they're not, really. What really gets senior managers' attention is the cost of sales, the cost of R&D, um, and so forth. I will tell you that within GlaxoSmithKline, they spend so little relative to all these other costs on manufacturing, it's effectively not even thought about. It's thought about at the local factory level, and it's thought about in other ways, but from a large corporate entity, it isn't the big driver. And that's true with very many high-value-added chemicals. It's not true of the petrochemical industry. The petrochemical, it's all about pounds, and it's a completely different paradigm. And certainly, yield in petrochemical industry is a big driver. In the batch chemical operating environment, yield is not. Okay, And again, it's pounds that you produce, uh, and that's the difference. It's volume. Um, this is just another graphic to show about where is it if you're, oh boy, that really did not show up very well. But basically, if you had a choice, 50% of this is materials cost. Um, employment represents about 25%. Maintenance and utility is about 15%. And depreciation is this little sliver, about 10% up here. So again, from a standpoint of manufacturing costs, really, the materials, that is what I'm buying, makes all the difference in the world. So again, this gets to the idea that designing for low cost and from an economic, social, and environmental perspective is the best approach to reduce overall manufacturing costs in the um, uh, manufacturing context, right? And it's by design. It's how you choose to, to make those materials. Uh, we can also talk about sales and marketing and just give you an idea that there's a lot more impacts just merely in driving cars around for sales and marketing than there are in manufacturing. So there are a lot of large obstacles 
but they're not insurmountable. There's a lot of high-powered brain power in this room, and we're really looking for you to make a difference. I keep saying that over and over again. The economics favor transition, even though senior managers don't know it. But it's absolutely possible, and it is something that we have to get to a point to make that case. And uh, just one notion here. Um, I've been in, in this space for a very long time, and what I will say is that you can have the best business case, you can have the best science and the best technology, and invariably it will be uh, thrown out the window if they don't trust you. It all boils down to the relationship that you have with a person and your credibility. So even though you have an indisputable set of facts, if they don't trust you, then you won't get forward. And that's really a lesson for life, is that it's really important that you don't think that if you build the perfect process and you have the perfect economics that you're going to win the day. It, it, I can tell you multiple times it doesn't. It's all about the relationship and the trust that they have in you and in, in your performance and your past history and so on and so forth. Relationships matter. So leadership is absolutely essential. Again, this notion of advocacy and really um, being out there in the front. You were great leaders today with the kids and showing them how to do the things. That's the kind of leadership we need. And extraordinary people skills. The days of being able to be uh, an introvert in your lab and never getting out and exercising new skills around people. Now, I'm a raging introvert. It takes a tremendous amount of energy for me to be with people all day. I've spoken more today than I have in the past six months, I guarantee it. But what I will tell you is that unless I'm going out there and making relationships with people and really getting to know them, I will not succeed. So that's really what I'm telling you today, is it's just really important that you establish great relationships, you develop people skills, you learn to work in teams, you become very collaborative in what you do, you reach out to people, you have partnerships, and that's really the name of the game. That's how we're going to succeed and make a difference. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, in the back. Well, I think there are a number of companies that have done uh, a tremendous amount of work in recent years. Unilever is one company that is definitely out, out there. I think Procter & Gamble has done a lot of very good work uh, across the board in many different areas. Um, a number of the automobile companies are doing a great job at trying to move things forward. Uh, from a standpoint of chemical companies, uh, BASF, is a leader, DuPont is a leader, Dow is a leader. Um, they're all doing a tremendous amount to make uh, products and processes more sustainable. Um, so, you know, th there are lots of very good examples of companies that are doing great work. Uh, some people are more enlightened than others, and there are some people that don't, still don't get it and fight it. Um, uh, so there are lots of opportunities and lots of organizations. The ACS 
is one organization that actually does a lot of public outreach. So uh, certainly in the Younger Chemist Committee, they do that, and certainly in the student chapters, there's a lot of opportunities. We encourage them to do outreach as part of that. If you're not a member of the ACS, then the AICHE is another organization. If you're an engineer, or there's a, virtually a lot of different professional societies that are trying to do more to, to have an outreach effort. I truly believe that um, there are a lot of people who are in a position to be silent leaders. And by that, I mean you, you kind of labor in anonymity many times. And you're doing your wet chemistry in the laboratory for many years. You may or may not be recognized for that. But you actually are making a difference. You know, you're doing this advocacy with the professor and all the other people who don't believe what you're doing. But that's hugely important because this is a generational thing. I mean, it'll dawn on people when things start running out and they can't do what they want to do. But we'll get there eventually. Yes? <laughs> um, gee, that's a really tough one. One of the things that I, I uh, have said recently that really surprises is just um, to practice humility. And, uh, you know, we're raised many times to think that we know a lot and that we, you know, in fact, one of the things that has impressed me as a person is how little I know. The more I learn, the, the less I know. And I think that many times we, we get to a point where we think we know everything. And so what I would say is, don't lose that sense of curiosity and discovery and that sense that maybe there are some things I can learn. Be a lifelong learner um, because that's really important to be open to new ideas and new ways of thinking about things. So that's, if I had to change anything, it would be just to open people up to the notion of, of um, thinking uh, a little bit with humility and with openness. Uh, to new ideas, to new people, to new ways of thinking about things. Yes, sir. So less than a month ago, a, a, a number of representatives from the American Chemical Society met with the African Federation of Chemistry. So it was a whole series of countries in Africa. Um, we are doing that throughout the world as, as a society. So we're meeting in China. Uh, there was a trip to Malaysia, doing it in Brazil, and so forth. One of the thrilling aspects of those trips, I'm not on them, but what I'm, what's thrilling to me is that they're all interested in green chemistry, every single one of them. As a matter of fact, at the African Congress, they, they, uh, there was a winner of the Pharmaceutical Roundtable Grant who was um, an African expatriate in Britain. They actually brought him to, the, to speak at that conference about his work in green chemistry for the Pharmaceutical Roundtable. So 
there's a tremendous amount of interest in green chemistry, and we're trying to reach out. We're a very small organization, uh, so we, again, have to work through people. There's a green chemistry networks. Throughout the world, there's multiple networks, and that's one of the modalities that we use to try and, and get through uh, and get to that. Um, there's green chemistry networks in Japan, in China, in India, um, through many parts of uh, Europe. Uh, I can't remember them all. There's about 30-some networks throughout the world. So that's some of the ways that we're trying to do it. But it's people like you who have come here for an education that hopefully can take these things back um, and really make a difference in the future.